So yesterday, or two days ago, I read an essay by Lynn Margulis about sex and death and kefir. And today, I am sitting in the forest at the Shivananda Ashram in the Catskills of New York, and I thought I would read you another story about fermented milk. Uh, this one from, from, what is it from? Well, it's from this book, The Play of God, Visions of the Life of Krishna by Banomali. Um, but of course, this story isn't actually by Ban Mali. This story is a very, very ancient story, but the English translation and interpretation is by Ban Al Mali. Um, Debbie Ban Al Mali, this woman. There she is. Um, so, this story is called The Butter Thief. Navanith Adhyaya Nam Namaha, homage to the one who plays with butter. So, um, this English word butter, I think the word yogurt is also in this story, but we're talking about fermented dairy here. I meditate on the enchanting form of Nanda's darling, with eyes like the petals of newly blown lotus, lips like the bimba berry, a face made entrancing by a beguiling smile, and whose color is that of water laden of and whose color is that of a water laden rain cloud. Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Very soon, Balarama and Krishna began to crawl about, and they got themselves into more scrapes than any other children. So this is a story about when Krishna was an infant or a toddler and he has a companion named Balarama. There was never a dull moment for Yashoda, who was Krishna's mother. In all her 45 years, she had never run so much. She forgot her normal household duties while watching the boys at play. Krishna would crawl forward very fast and then turn his head and look over his shoulder when he heard the sound of tinkling bells coming from his own ankles, as if to see who was following him. That inquiring look was irresistible. Up she would jump, run after him, pick him up, and kiss him all over his cherubic face. He'd wriggle out of her arms and crawl as fast as he could, with bells tinkling and feet twinkling like the twin rose petals blown in the wind. Where was he? By the time she caught up with him, he would be with the big mother cow, pulling off her young one with one small hand and drinking milk straight from her udder as he had watched the calf do. Yashoda would scream in terror, for the cow was noted for her vicious nature, and she was already shaking her head in a menacing manner, bringing her huge horns closer to the child. Yashoda would stand, petrified, not knowing whether to run and pick up the child, or whether that would irritate the cow further. But as she stood, rooted, this fierce cow would put out its rough tongue and lick the little bottom as affectionately as she licked her own calf. Krishna would turn around and look at his mother as if to say, See, mother, all creatures love me, for I am the soul of all. But poor mother, she would think it was another miracle, and she would snatch him up and tell him never to do such a thing again. So then he would follow her into the kitchen and put his hand into every pot until he came to the one with the butter, eating some and pasting the rest all over his face, and the little kittens would come mewing and lick his face with delight. The mother was now in a dilemma, not knowing whether to attend to her household duties or to watch the child. So playful and restless was he that he had to be constantly guarded from the dangers of cows, fire, cats, knives, ponds, thorns, and birds. Once he started to toddle, it was even worse. One day, Ishoda heard him call her excitedly, and she rushed out to see him hanging perilously over the well. Mother, mother, come and see, there's a little boy just like me in the well. Come take him out, mother. Yashoda rushed and caught him. Never do that again, she admonished. And ever after that, every time she drew water from the well, she would imagine his face peeping from the water. There was no mischief he was incapable of doing. The little hands were busy with everything. One moment he would be brandishing the kitchen knife, and the next he would try to pluck the hot coals from the fire. 
So, at every moment of the day, Yashoda kept running after him, and for the rest of her life to come, she continued to see his face everywhere, in the coals, in the fire, in the water, near the cow, whether she was cutting vegetables or plucking flowers. Thus did he prepare her for the separation to come. This is a lesson to all housewives. It is difficult to fix our minds on a formless god while doing mundane tasks, but how easy to recall the mischievous exploits of that divine child peeking and laughing at us in peeking and laughing at us and through our most tedious chores in peeking and laughing at us in and through our most tedious chores so that's an interesting point about religions that ultimately they're trying to get us to comprehend some sort of transcendent reality experience some sort of transcendent reality, but transcendent reality is formless, and so very often it is helpful to use an empathetic image. That's why these images of Jesus abound, even though the God he represents is formless. Same here with Krishna. It's a lot easier to empathize with a tiny mischievous boy than the abstract soul of the world. And so we have stories about a tiny mischievous boy, all the while keeping in mind that what he represents is the soul of the world. Sometimes, some of the other gopis would beg to be allowed to take him to their houses for the day, and Yashoda would, Yashoda would reluctantly agree, for she could not bear to be parted from him even for a moment. Once he had been taken to a house, he would go uninvited. In fact, he would steal into their houses like a rogue and help, him, help himself to their butter, their ghee, their curd, and their milk, which were their prized possessions. Such, as his kindness, such is his kindness that once we invite him into our hearts, he'll come unbidden, steal the butter of our love, and bless us with the riches we have never asked for. One day, the gopis gathered together and began to speak of Krishna's pranks to his mother. The charges against him were numerous. He comes and releases the calves before milking time. He steals the butter, milk, and curd, and after consuming what he wants, he distributes it to his playmates if they are there, or else to kittens and baby monkeys who follow him in the hopes of getting something. After he has had his fill, he breaks the pots. If we scold him, he laughs at us. What should we do to him? Why don't you give him what he wants? asked his doting mother. After all, he's only a child and he loves these things. Why don't you give him a glass of milk and some butter as soon as he comes? At the end of the month, you may present me the bill and I'll meet it. Oh, but we do give him, they chorused. We give him as much as a, such a small boy can eat, but still he comes into the house unseen and steals more. If we hang up the curd, he makes a hole at the bottom and drinks from below as it drips down. After he has finished, his friends drink the last drops and his friends drink, and the last drops are lapped up by the kittens. Another gopi took up the sad tale. Once I hung the milk pot so high that he couldn't reach it even with a stick, and you know what he did? He dragged a pounding stone from outside, I don't know how, and then he clambered up it, broke the pot with a stick, opened his little mouth, and stood there drinking the milk that was pouring down. Half of it went into his mouth, some over his body, and the rest on the floor, to the delight of the waiting kittens. Now look at him standing there, the picture of innocence having done so much mischief. Krishna was hiding behind his mother and peeping out, his face quivering with pretended fright, and his eyes anxiously rounded at the hearing of these accounts of his misdeeds. He was sucking a worried thumb and peeping anxiously at his mother's face to see how she was taking it. Yashoda's only response was to laugh. She could not bring herself to scold her darling for any reason. Never mind, she comforted the gophies. I'll replace your mud pots with golden ones. Thus, each of them got a golden pot in lieu of the one he had broken, and this was exactly what he had wanted, for he wanted them to enjoy all the luxuries which were there in his own house. But still the complaints grew, so Yashoda started watching her little one very carefully to see when he went and perpetrated these misdeeds. She soon came to the conclusion that he could never have done any of the crimes that were being laid at his door for the simple reason that he was never out of her sight for more than a few minutes at a time. Is it possible that these gopis are making up these stories to get golden pots, she wondered. Just then another gopi came with a different tale. 
S just listen to this, mother, she said. You know that I've been st that I started v being very careful with my things and always keep them locked up so Krishna can't get them. Yesterday he was really angry when he found nothing to, st to steal, so he gave a pinch to my little daughter and made her wake up and scream just as he was leaving. Krishna grinned when he had heard this, for that child was Radha, who was going to be his beloved playmate in the future. And he was asking her, Why are you wasting time sleeping when you should be concentrated on growing up? What knowledge can you have of happiness that makes... What knowledge can you have of happiness that makes you smile now? I'll show you such delights that nothing else can be comparable. So saying, he had pinched her, and she had awakened squalling. Yashoda could not believe what the gopi was saying, so she said, Well, the next time he does something of that kind, just catch him and bring him to me, and I'll punish him. The gopi agreed doubtfully, for she knew him to be a slippery customer. However, with little luck, she managed to catch him red-handed the next day, when he was actually standing with his hands in a pot of butter. She grabbed him by his buttery hands and dragged him to the house. Just as they reached the turning, he said, Look, what's this? She relaxed her hold and take a look, and poof! His buttery hand slipped out of her grasp, and off he went like a streak of blue light. She panted after him, but he was all quicksilver, and she was all lead. She puffed into his house and found him sitting in his mother's lap on the swing, looking a picture of cherubic innocence. Aha! So this is where you have got to, is it? she asked. Look, Yoshoda, I caught this child red-handed stealing butter hardly ten minutes ago, and I was dragging him here to show you. Just as we reached the turn, he was off like a shot, and now look at him sitting there as if butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Yashoda looked at her in astonishment. She was sure that the gopi's powers of fabrication were enormous. What are you talking about, she asked. This child has been sitting in my lap listening to a story for the past hour. How can he possibly have been with you ten minutes ago? The gopi stared. She should have expected this, she thought resentfully. Naturally, the mother would side with her child. But what a bare-faced lie! How could Yashoda make up such a story? The two of them kept silent while Krishna smiled. How God can appear to so many at one, at the same time, how God can appear to so many at one and the same time is a mystery to all. At last, seeing the gopi's crestfallen look, Yashoda said kindly, Never mind. Next time you catch him, be sure you tie him up securely and bring him to me, and I promise to punish him. Happily, the gopi was able to test the truth of the promise the very next day. Krishna allowed himself to be caught, for after all, she was Radha's mother. Determined to take no chances, she put him inside a big empty chest in a corner, locked it up, and pocketed the key. Just you wait there, you little rogue, and think of some new mischief while I finish my work and take you to your loving mother. Then we'll see. After finishing her work, she lugged the heavy chest up the small incline leading to Yashoda's house. Here he is, she panted in triumph. Here's your innocent son. I've caught him and locked him up as you suggested. When did you catch him? Yashoda asked curiously. Soon after lunch, Radha's mother replied. He joined us for lunch and then left very properly out the front door, only to creep in through the back gate and steal the butter from the larder. Mind you, this was not even for himself. He was too full after the heavy lunch I gave him. I caught him distributing the day's butter, the result of a hard morning labor, to cats and the monkeys. Yashoda gasped. Either you're mad or I am, she said. Krishna had his lunch with us today. In fact, he sat between his father and his brother, and he's been playing here ever since. Now open the chest and let's see who's right, you or I. Without hesitation, the gopi went and opened the chest, for she had no doubt who was right. Both of them peered into the chest, and lo, staring at them with tear-filled eyes, was the gopi's own daughter. Yashoda had a hearty laugh. Well, well, I never realized your eyesight was so poor. The poor gopi was completely bewildered. How could she grasp the fact that God can appear in all places at the same time, for he is everywhere? After that, she never dared go to Yashoda with her complaints, and her devotion and love for Krishna grew day by day. Her little daughter grew up, seeing her great devotion, and from that time onward, gave her heart to him. This is a really silly story. I don't, I don't know if I like the kind of messages that this story is giving, <laughs> but uh, we're going to finish it anyway. One day, the bigger children, including his brother Balrama, rushed out to eat the fruits of a tree growing in the compound. Krishna loved those fruits, so he toddled after them, even though nobody had thought of inviting him. They shooed him off as being too small to climb trees. Still, he insisted on accompanying them, so they agreed to give him the task of picking up the fruits as they fell. 
Now mind you, don't eat a single one, they warned, knowing his capacity for food. Your job is only to collect the fruits, and we'll come and divide them equally. All right, he said meekly. The big boys, including Balarama, scrambled up and started dropping bunches of lovely ripe purple fruits to the ground. Krishna started picking them up and gobbling them as fast as he could. He crammed his mouth, and his little hands were going up and down like pistons from the ground to his mouth. After some time, one of the boys chanced to look down and discovered what was going on. Hey, stop that nonsense at once, he shouted. Look at Krishna, he called to the others. He's eating the fruit instead of collecting it. Stop it, stop it, all of them shouted from the top of the tree. All the little heads popped out from among the branches, shouting angrily at Krishna, who seemed supremely unconscious of the whole affair and continued to cram his mouth. The purpley fluid was oozing down the corner of his mouth, and in his hurry to eat as much as he could, he had not even cleaned the fruit. Quite a bit of mud was also, had also found its way into his mouth. The boys came sliding down and shook him hard. What do you think you're doing? they shouted. Krishna did not speak a word for the simple reason that his mouth was packed with fruit. All right, we'll show you, they cried, and ran inside, searching for his mother. Oh, mother, they cried, your son is eating mud. Ashoda came running out to find what all the commotion was about. Your son is eating mud, they cried, pointing accusingly at Krishna. Have you been eating mud, she repeated sternly. Krishna shook his curly head and started sniffing loudly as a prelude to crying. He dared not open his mouth yet, for he hadn't quite finished swallowing the fruit. Ask him to open his mouth, mother, Balrama urged. Glare... Krishna glared at him as if he couldn't believe that his brother would stoop to such a low trick. Yes, ask him to open his mouth, the rest of the boys chorused. Open your mouth, Krishna, Yasoda said sternly. Krishna turned his limpid gaze on her. Have you forgotten what happened when you looked into my mouth the last time? Was the unspoken question. She had indeed forgotten, or probably misunderstood. If so, the time was propitious for another lesson, or perhaps, he thought, if she wanted to see mud, she could have her fill of it. And the Lord, who had become a human child out of sport, without any loss of his divine powers, now opened his rosebud mouth. She bent forward to peer more closely, and lo, she felt herself to be whirling in space, lost in time, for inside the baby mouth was seen the whole universe of moving and unmoving creation, the earth and its mountains and oceans, the moon and the stars, and all the planets and regions. She was wonderstruck to see the land of Raja and the village of Gokula, herself standing there with the child Krishna beside her with a wide open mouth, and within that mouth another universe, and so on, and so on. Oh God, she thought, am I going mad, or is this a dream of magic wrought by this strange child of mine? Krishna, she cried, clinging to his name like a drowning person to a lifeline. Krishna! It was a despairing cry, for she felt her head whirling. Immediately he shut his mouth, and she got back her equilibrium. In a trice, she had almost forgotten what she had seen. Why have you been eaten? Why, why have you been eating? She stopped in mid-sentence. What a fool she was. This child carried the whole universe within himself, and she was worrying about a few grains of sand? Krishna, oh Krishna, she whispered, snatching up her boy in her arms. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? She whispered, nuzzling his baby curls with her lips. Before the astonished gaze of a dozen small boys, she carried her darling inside, caressing him and murmuring endearments to him. The boys gazed after her, the boys gave, gazed after her in disappointment. You really couldn't tell with adults, they decided. There was no saying how they would react. They had fully expected to enjoy the spectacle of Krishna howling for mercy from an irate mother, and look at her, hugging and kissing him. He whom the Vedantas speak of as Brahman whom the yogis consider the Atman, and whom devotees call Bhagavan, the Supreme One, was considered by Yashoda to be her own son. Thus ends the fourth chapter of the play of the god named the Butter Thief, Hari Om Tat Sat. May we be able to know Narayana, for that do we do meditate on Vasudeva. May Vishnu guide us, Narayana Suktam. So I don't necessarily want to be an apologist for for some of the um,
I guess more more conservative aspects of the story or like there's a moral about about un you know unending love um love without terms. Um, but but I think it's an important story. Um, I think about it from time to time. I'm gonna upload another video about butter and yogurt and biology and cosmology and whatnot. You know, that image. Let's read that image again. Um, And the Lord, who had become a human child out of sport, without any loss of his divine powers, now opened his rosebud mouth. She bent forward to peer more closely, and lo, she felt herself to be whirling in space, lost in time, for inside the baby mouth was seen the whole universe of moving and unmoving creation, the earth and its mountains and oceans, the moon and stars, and all the planets and regions. She was wonderstruck to see the land of Raja and the village of Gokula, herself standing there with the child Krishna beside her with a wide open mouth, and within that mouth another universe, and so on and so on. Oh God, she thought, am I going mad, or is this a dream of magic wrought by this strange child of mine? Krishna, she cried, clinging to his name like a drowning person to a lifeline. Krishna. So a vision of the fractal nature of reality embodied in an infant boy. Of course, it's just a story. There's never been an infant boy like that. Never, ever. But nonetheless, the message is important that that the entire the entire span of reality can be represented by a mother's love for her child. Um, yeah, that's that's the moral I want to get out of this. There are some less tasteful morals that you could also get out of this story. Stories can be interpreted however you wish, but that's the moral that I want to take from this, that the entirety of reality can be symbolized and represented by love. Not that an individual's love is all of reality, but it can represent it, can symbolize it, and point to it. That's what stories do. They, they point to things beyond themselves. Okay. See you later. Next time maybe we'll talk about the relationship between sex and death in Kafir and this story. <laughs>